on World News Tonight. Missile mania. North Korea is not easing up on its firing schedule as a record number of projectiles cause mass warnings in the peninsula. Crisis averted. Russia backtracks on its controversial revocation of the grain deal following a compromise. Flooding fears. Australia prepares for the worst, with water levels rising rapidly by the minute. And Cake Castle, an interactive art exhibit full of delicious goodness or as hungry minds. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. North Korea continued its barrage of weapons tests firing at least three missiles, including a suspected intercontinental ballistic missile that forced the Japanese government to issue evacuation alerts and temporarily halt trains. North Korea fired multiple ballistic missiles on Thursday. They include one that South Korean and Japanese officials believe may have been an ICBM, the North's longest-range ballistic missile designed to carry a nuclear warhead to the other side of the planet. Warnings blared in parts of Japan telling residents to seek shelter indoors. Japan's defense chief later walked back on the warning. He said the government had lost track of the missile over the Sea of Japan. Retired top naval officer Yoji Koda told a loss of radar tracking on a projectile often means a failed launch. At least two other missiles that were launched appeared to be short-range weapons. Thursday's launch comes a day after North Korea fired at least 23 missiles, the most it has fired in a single day one that landed less than 40 miles off South Korea's coast for the first time, triggering air raid warnings and prompting South Korea to launch missiles of its own. Tensions have simmered as Pyongyang has demanded the US and South Korea stop large-scale military drills. Some North Korea alleges simulate targeting the Hermit Kingdom. The Allies say the drills are defensive and are needed to counter threats from the North. We have some breaking news tonight. Pakistan's former PM Imran Khan has been shot and wounded during a protest march in the eastern city of Wazirabad in an apparent assassination attempt. Members of his PTI party said another four people were hurt, but no one was killed. The extent of other injuries is not yet known. PTI senior leader Asad Umar stated that a bullet hit Khan in his foot after an unidentified gunman opened fire, who was later arrested by the Pakistani police. The former Pakistan cricket captain was taken from the rally site just outside the town of Gujranwala to receive treatment in Lahore. Imran Khan was leading the march on the capital Islamabad to demand snap elections after he was ousted. Khan was unseated in a vote of no confidence in April following claims of bad governance and economic mismanagement. Since then, he has repeatedly claimed without providing any evidence that the United States had orchestrated his ouster. Khan's allegations have become a staple at rallies he has held across Pakistan in a bid to return to power. His claims have struck a chord with the young population in a country where anti-American sentiment runs high and anti-establishment feelings are being fueled by a rising cost of living crisis. This instance, however, not the first time that Pakistani politicians have been attacked. Meanwhile, the US is accusing North Korea of supplying artillery shells to Russia, helping Moscow in its war against Ukraine. The White House says the regime is funneling the shells through third countries to conceal their true destination. According to White House National Security Council spokesman John Kirby on Wednesday, Washington has information indicating that North Korea is supplying a large number of artillery shells to Russia for Moscow's ongoing aggression in Ukraine. Speaking at a virtual meeting, Kirby said that while the North publicly denied that it intended to provide ammunition to Russia, Pyongyang has indeed been supplying Russia with a significant number of artillery shells for its war in Ukraine. U.S. State Department spokesperson Ned Price also echoed Kirby's remarks, adding that the North was trying to conceal the true destination of its arms shipment to Russia by funneling them through third countries in the Middle East and North Africa. The DPRK is covertly supplying Russia's war in Ukraine uh, with a significant number of artillery shells uh, uh, while obfuscating the real destination of these arms shipments uh, by trying to make it appear as though they're being sent to countries in the Middle East or uh, North Africa. It's unclear, according to Washington, whether any of the shipments from North Korea have reached Russia yet. Meanwhile, 
Kirby insisted shells from North Korea will not change the course of the war in Ukraine, but said they will add to Russia's ability to kill more people in the European country. He added that the U.S. will work to hold North Korea accountable. The NSC spokesperson also condemned North Korea's missile provocations after Pyongyang fired more than 20 missiles on Wednesday, one of which landed in waters south of the northern limit line, calling it a reckless decision. Grain shipments from Ukraine will resume after Russia agreed to rejoin a UN-backed initiative to allow exports via the Black Sea, ending a standoff that threatened to reignite a global food crisis. Russia has agreed to resume Moscow's participation in the grain deal brokered by the UN and Turkey. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has said Russian authorities confirmed the humanitarian grain corridor would continue in the same way as before. Earlier, Russian leader Vladimir Putin had told his Turkish counterpart that Moscow would only consider resuming the deal if he could secure real guarantees from Kiev. Russia suspended its participation previously due to Saturday's drone attack on Moscow's fleet in Crimea, one that Putin blamed on Ukraine. Kiev has not claimed responsibility and has denied using the safe shipping corridor for military purposes. In his nightly address, Ukrainian President Zelensky said the Grain Corridor needed reliable protection and that Russia should receive a tough international response for disrupting food exports. This is literally a matter of life for tens of millions of people. Earlier, Zelensky had welcomed the European Commissioner for Energy in Kyiv. Hundreds of residents in major regional towns across Australia's most populous state are being urged to leave homes as slow-moving floodwaters push downstream. New South Wales Emergency Services Minister Steph Cook said the flooding risk was very, very high. Authorities are urging residents to evacuate from parts of the New South Wales regional towns of Wagga Wagga and Forbes, collectively home to roughly 90,000. Flooding at Forbes, roughly five hours' drive west of Sydney, could hit a 70-year high. Across Australia's most populous state, emergency services conducted 15 flood rescues in the past 24 hours. 104 emergency warnings are in place. Blue skies have replaced rain across most of the New South Wales, with little rain forecast for the weekend, but emergency services will warn rivers will keep rising for days as water seeps into already swollen floodwaters moving slowly downstream. Following days of unrest and countless protests on the announcement of Lula da Silva's election win, President Jair Bolsonaro has reportedly conceded the election results and is now requesting of his supporters to clear the blockades and accept the result. After days of road blockades across Brazil in protest of Jair Bolsonaro's election loss on Sunday, the president on Wednesday finally asked the protesters to clear out. I know you're upset. I know you're upset. You're sad. You expected something else. So did I. I'm just as upset as sad as you are. But we have to keep our head in place. Truckers, who are core Bolsonaro supporters that benefited from his policies to lower fuel prices, have blocked hundreds of highways nationwide since Monday. That's after electoral officials announced on Sunday that leftist former president Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva narrowly beat Bolsonaro in the runoff presidential election. The blockades have created miles-long backups and threatened to disrupt supply chains. In his video posted on social media, Bolsonaro called them illegal. Having the roads closed is harming everyone. The appeal I make to you, clear the roads, protest in another way and in other places because this is very welcome and is part of democracy. His message came as momentum grew among his supporters for the military to intervene. Today, people are gathered here asking for a federal intervention because we believe there was fraud in the election. We are here legally, peacefully, democratically as a counter to the coup, this corrupt criminal system that organized the election through the Superior Electoral Court has delivered a blow to Brazil via the polls. 
In response to a request for comment, Brazil's defense ministry said peaceful demonstrations were part of free expression under Brazilian law. It added, quote, the defense ministry is guided by the federal constitution. Before Sunday's vote, Bolsonaro repeatedly made baseless claims that Brazil's electoral system was open to fraud. As of Wednesday night, the outgoing president had still not officially conceded his election loss, though his cabinet has begun a process of transition. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was set to return to power in one of the most right-wing coalitions in Israel's history, causing jitters among Palestinians and Arab neighbors who fear it could ratchet up tensions across the Middle East. In Jerusalem, the front pages have all but proclaimed Benjamin Netanyahu as Israel's new Prime Minister as the five-time former leader looks set to win the parliamentary elections. With almost all votes counted, Netanyahu's conservative Likud party, along with its ultra-right and ultra-orthodox allies, appear to have secured a majority in parliament. The likely victory of Netanyahu's bloc over incumbent Prime Minister Yair Lapid's centre-left could put an end to a recent period of political turmoil in the country. Critics have raised concerns that Netanyahu's right-wing ultra-nationalist alliance could further heighten tensions in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. On Wednesday, Israeli soldiers killed a young Palestinian man at a checkpoint in the West Bank. Since the beginning of the year, incidents linked to sectarian violence have left at least 137 dead on the Palestinian side and 23 on the Israeli side. Russia's war in Ukraine has woken Germany up to the risk of having an economy that is too reliant on raw materials provided by an autocratic strongman. But as the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz heads to Beijing, there are questions as to whether he would rather leave lessons from the recent past at home in Berlin. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz travels to Beijing this week in what is turning out to be a highly controversial trip. It comes at a time as the EU looks to reduce its dependency on countries like China, even if the bloc considers it both a partner and systemic rival. The European Commission recently warned member states not to be naive when it comes to Chinese investments in the continent's critical infrastructure. The criticism could be seen as referring to Scholz, who last week allowed China to buy a stake in the port of Hamburg, a crucial trading hub in Europe. One line of thinking in Berlin now is to shore up relations between Brussels and Beijing. But some allies of the German Chancellor see the trip as more in the interests of Germany rather than the EU's. Everyone is saying this is the moment to be reducing dependencies on China. One should at least not become, be becoming more uh, dependent and embroiled in a Chinese economic system that is going into this kind of autarkic um, struggle environment at the moment. And, and I think that's the thing that's still slightly mystifying people about this trip because they haven't given a clear message on really what the intent of any of this is. Xi Jinping has just secured an historic third term as Chinese president, potentially allowing him to rule for life. Schultz will likely see this in his reasoning for the trip. Many tensions remain, however, including the situation with Taiwan and Beijing's ambiguous position on the war in Ukraine. Warring sides in the brutal two-year conflict in Ethiopia's Tigray have agreed to a truce, the African Union's mediator said following marathon talks in South Africa. In a dramatic diplomatic breakthrough on Wednesday, the Ethiopian government and Tigrayan forces agreed to a surprise deal, putting a halt to a two-year war that has killed thousands, displaced millions, and left hundreds of thousands facing famine. Delegates from both sides signed an agreement in South Africa just over a week after formal peace talks began. Two parties in the Ethiopian conflict have formally agreed to the cessation of hostilities, as well as to systematic, orderly, smooth, and coordinated disarmament. Olushagun Obasanjo from the African Union mediation team praised the process as an African solution to an African problem. This moment is not the end of peace process, but the beginning of it. An agreement had not been expected so soon. The United Nations called it a step in the right direction. This is very much a welcome first step, uh, which we hope 
uh, can start to bring some solace uh, to the millions of Ethiopian civilians that have really suffered uh, during this, on this conflict. In Washington, U.S. State Department spokesperson Ned Price told reporters it will continue to engage to advance the peace agreement. What we will have to see is follow through. And the United States will be there. Uh, we will be there to continue working with the African Union. They will continue to lead this process. The war stems from a breakdown in relations between regional power blocks over control of Ethiopia as a whole. The agreement does not address the deeper political tensions that contributed to the conflict. Eritrea and other forces from inside Ethiopia who have taken part in the conflict on Ethiopia's side did not take part in the talks. An angry mob attacked a convoy of the United Nations mission in Congo, leaving two peacekeepers wounded and a vehicle torched in the eastern North Kivu province, where government troops are battling M23 rebels. Civilians in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo attacked a United Nations peacekeeping convoy when it stopped at an army checkpoint near an internally displaced person site five miles from the city of Goma. They threw stones at the convoy, setting fire to at least one truck and injuring two people, the UN mission said on Wednesday. In the region, frustration has grown with the UN mission, which civilians accuse of failing to protect them from worsening militia violence. Earlier on Tuesday, the UN announced a strategic and tactical withdrawal of 450 peacekeepers from Rumangabo, located further north near Virunga Park. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Delhi's 20 million residents were effectively breathing smoke as the air quality index breached the severe and hazardous categories in nearly all monitoring stations of the Indian capital, with students asking for authorities to shut down their schools for some days. An effigy of former UK Prime Minister Liz Truss is set to go up in flames on November the 5th as the Eden Bridge Bonfire Society's 2022 celebrity figure. Christians in Bahrain excitedly await Pope Francis's arrival as they gear up for the religious leader's first visit to the Gulf country. During his visit, the pontiff will attend the Bahrain Forum for Dialogue as a sign of unity. The Federal Reserve raised interest rates by three quarters of a percentage point again and said its battle against inflation will require borrowing costs to rise further, but hinted at small increases in the future. Israeli forces killed a Palestinian man in the occupied West Bank during a raid that the Israeli military said elicited violent riots. The 54-year-old man was shot dead at the site of the attack. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. If you have a sweet tooth, Cakeland may be just the place for you. We leave you tonight with visuals of an impressive art gallery that takes the shape of a giant multi-layered cake. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.